basically, I'm here because um, my brother is serving more than 10 years in prison, federal prison, for um, having uh, child abuse material, otherwise known as child porn, um, and attempting to meet up with a 12-year-old for sex. So that's why we're here, but I'd, I'd like to start way back when because you know when something like this happens to a family and it does happen to the entire family um you at least i try and search and see what went wrong right um and uh and if i if anything is left out or you're confused just ask. ask me yes. okay because there's a lot of information i was just gonna say too i feel yeah. like when something well, something like that happens it leaves you with so many questions. You, I mean, there are more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. And the theme that I've got from my searching our past is this sort of failure to be honest with ourselves. Um, and what happens when, when you're not honest with yourself is, you know, you don't have these very necessary conversations and you are left with more questions. There's just this sort of veil of, of ignorance um yeah. and it's very easy to live in ignorance and it's easy to not look at the dark side of our lives um but then we pay the price with with something like this and i'll go into you know why that's the sort of theme that i that i've taken from my my research not just thinking back into into our lives but research about pedophilia and sex offenders and what we could possibly do to prevent this from yeah. happening. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the theme for me is like personal responsibility, family responsibility, um, um, you know, being honest with ourselves and and creating a, a family and a social structure uh, such that we are able to be honest with each other. Yeah, I was going to say too, yeah. I feel like it's very easy when something like this happens to allow it to break a family apart. And I think that that, I mean, if you think about it, that's almost like the natural thing that would happen because it's like a volcano erupting in the middle of your family. It's like, what do we do now? Yep. But it's almost like on the flip side, it's a chance to really, like you said, research and figure it out and almost get closer and get, like build this stronger foundation so that you can help the world as a whole you would think you right. would think and that's my instinct and i'll tell you and i'll get but not to everybody it. thinks that way yeah exactly so it's hard it's hard to think that way it's brave yeah and i'm not saying oh i'm so brave mm -hmm. but like it's it's brave and courageous because the consequences nobody likes sex offenders you like a murderer more right. than, more than you like a sex offender because let's think about it um you're violating not only sometimes a child when you're, you know, engaging in this stuff, but you're violating the most sacred of our humanity. Innocence, right? yeah. Yeah, innocence and and the thing that that bears children. You know, the, the what what is sex? It's it's a way to reproduce, to keep the species going. It's the most sacred thing that yeah. you could possibly have in your life and somebody's violating it. And so we have this deep disgust for these people and that's been something I've had to reckon with. It's like, is, is my brother a monster? I don't think so. But then again, he's done monstrous things. So it's like, how do you sleep at night? Yeah. And even though I'm, you know, and I'll go into this too, but like, I didn't raise him. Like, he's not my kid, but he's my brother. It's like, we share. <laughs> and the thing is too, is this is just something that I feel like I've, I don't want to say learned because, you know, everybody, everybody's going to have a different perspective on things. You know, some people are going to say that people are born this way. Some people are going to say it's because of how they were raised. Some people are going to say it's a chemical imbalance. Everybody's going to have different opinions. In my opinion, when someone does something, whether it's murder or they are just violating children in that way, I think that there's something – not right. And I don't think that it's always your upbringing. Yeah. I don't think that it's always something you're necessarily born with. Right. There's just I, – I really – this is just my opinion. Yeah. I just believe that 
there is some sort of imbalance in the brain that they cannot think straight. If so, they could, you yeah, know what I mean? Like, I, I, I just, I I'm agree. Gonna, I just. I'm going to tell you the research that I've done because there's okay. not that much of it. It's easy. It's easy enough to find. Um, but the research on this, since this is kind of unfolding naturally, or, um, when I did look into this, there's a great podcast called um, Hunting Warhead. And they bring up this German study that was done. I don't remember the year. A lot, a lot of this information is very fuzzy because mm -hmm. it's all happened over the last like four years or so. Um, but but these two journalists did uh, this podcast on these two guys who were running a, um, I don't know what do you call it, basically w some of the biggest websites for child porn. And they were these young guys, like, early 20s and right one of them was kind of had this what you're just describing as this sort of he was incapable of seeing he had justified it to such an extent that he was incapable of seeing how his actions were wrong right the other guy was like i should have never done this this is monstrous this is horrible and he took responsibility mm -hmm. you know and they're both now serving prison sentences but he also, they also covered this German study where they gathered, I think it was a couple thousand guys. They did this huge public outreach campaign to interview people who were attracted to children. Nine out of 10 of them were men. And what they found was exactly what you were saying, um, inborn. Had it since they were, right. since they could remember. Now you have this, these other elements coming up where, you know, porn addiction was not a thing in the 1950s because guess what? We didn't have access to, um, you know, uh, these things right. are, you can get, you can see anything you want on there instantly. And so you can't convince me that. And it was like fuels an addiction more. Right. Yeah. And so when you have access to it, same thing with drugs. When drugs became widely mm -hmm. available, it was like parties on for these people who were predisposed to having certain vices and addictions. So you should definitely listen to it. It's called okay. Hunting Warhead. But then, and you can go and look at the actual German study. I believe I found it. Um, it's been a while, but I did look online and I found this study. Um, but many of them were not offending. Um, many of them were like, I'm disgusted with myself for having these thoughts. And so it's those guys. And the other thing was that not all sex offenders have the same attractions. Some mm -hmm. of them have them to teenagers, some of them have them to little kids. Um, another person you want to follow for this information is uh, Michael Bailey. He does a lot of sex research and he's been doing it for many decades. Um, and so what he will tell you also, where is I going with that? Um, well, basically what between the few studies that are out there, um, we, we know that there are non-offenders. Most of these people, if not all of them, are born with the attraction. But it's these guys, these non-offenders, and knowing that it's inborn um, tells me that we don't actually have to go down the path of offending. If there is a way to intervene through social means, mm -hmm. um, we should probably do that. Right. <laughs> it will save children, um, and it will save these these horrible stories from happening. So... That's sort of a little primer on yeah. it. Um, oh, that was the other thing I was going to say was what Michael Bailey found was that the the lower the IQ, um, the the lower the age of attraction. Interesting. Interesting. So wow. you're just talking about neurology. Right. You're talking about people who, and you see this sometimes in developmental disabilities where they've never grown up. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really that surprising that they have sexual attractions towards People who are I, there. I would never even have thought about right? that. The other thing they found, which was interesting, not only the correlation with IQ, but they found a correlation between left-handedness. So it's not that every sex offender has is left-handed, but say I don't know what the normal um, distribution of left-handedness is for the general population, but let's say it's like ten percent. I believe it was like thirty percent for sex offenders. They also found a correlation with height. Interesting. 
all of this stuff in my mind, okay, what are we going to do? Okay, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to abort every left-handed baby, right? Mm -hmm. That's insane. Uh, we're not going to do some sort of, you know, genetic selection for this stuff. But it's, again, it comes back to knowing the truth and not being willfully ignorant about any information that we can gather. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at is I, when this happened, I just consumed as much information as I possibly could um, because that's who I am. And I'll tell you why I am the way I am. And I think I'm a little bit different from the rest of my family in that. Mm -hmm. I think that was great too because it gives people a background and an understanding of, like you said, the research of things and not just somebody being a monster. Right. Because I think that a lot of times when – People do things like this. People's minds automatically jump to the conclusion of they're a monster. What's wrong with them? They did this by choice. And I don't think that people really understand like our brains are so complex and there are so many things that can cause things to go south. So many different yep. things that I don't think it is just as simple as they made a choice to do that. Yep. And just to be clear, and I don't know if I said this while we were recording or not, you know, this conversation should not be about hatred for my family. Right. I would say all of this to them if they were interested. Um, I love them deeply and I'm still connected with all of them, you know, in some capacity. And some of them, it's at a sort of arm's length, but I still love them. And, and I wouldn't want to lose any sort of relationship with them. Um, and I just want to put that out there, no matter what is said here, um, it is not out of a, a sense of hatred or anger. Right. Um, I just, it's better to talk about stuff than to not. I agree. You know? it's a, it brings awareness and there there's so many things that talking about your personal stories and experiences do. But I think like even what you just touched on, like I just said, bringing awareness to just the background of it. And then too, if anybody knows someone in their life and they're dealing with something like this and they don't know – how to cope or handle it within themselves, it makes them feel not so alone because like you said, it does affect everybody around you. I cannot tell you the, the level of loneliness that- Absolutely, I'm yeah. sure. Um, because, and w yeah. almost wanting to be quiet. Why would oh, like, it's not something of, that you, <laughs> you want to go around and talk about naturally. None, none of my, so the only people that know this story fully are like maybe two or three people. Um, those second tier friends, they don't know anything about right. this. And so, um, but you're absolutely right. I think talking about it is better than not talking about it. And if you do have somebody in your life who's, and I'll get into this too, who's struggling with literally any vice, like let's, let's try and be there for each other. Mm -hmm. Like our culture, I don't know if you felt this, but it feels like the social connectedness is disintegrating. Yes. And I'm not sure if it's ever been fully there in my lifetime. No, I don't think it's ever fully been there, but I definitely think, and I've said this many times on the show, I think social media can be great for things like this and yep. for many other things, but I also think it can serve as a way of judgment and comparison and competition. Yeah. And I think that all of that drives people further apart Absolutely. because everybody's in competition. Nobody wants right. to help somebody else. Right. right. You see somebody that used to be your friend on social media doing something you right. disagree with. It's and like now automatic, all of a sudden, automatic hate. Now all of a sudden feelings. you'll never talk to them again. Right. Or, or, and, or, or there's just a big question mark and, and our friendships are so thin and, mm -hmm. and brittle and they're not, like I said, I, I think there was a time in the, in the before time, maybe before both of us were born, like, where people were more socially intertwined and strongly connected, maybe when people went to church more, maybe when people ha had social clubs that they were more involved with volunteering. I don't know. I mean, well, I was We also around. live in a very sensitive world where if someone doesn't agree with one thing right. you say, it's like it's they over. can't be friends with you. Yes. It's the end of the world. And it's horrible. I know. Because there's so much more yeah and, and to if, life than right. that and if i if i ended a relationship with everybody that i disagreed with i would be i would have no right. friends same because i have a lot of opinions <laughs> right i was gonna say and at the end of the day not that we're always gonna think we're right, right but they're our opinions so we're gonna take our own side so obviously exactly. right we're gonna think everybody else is crazy but it's right. fine right and it's no right. I, yeah i agree though it, yeah. it's it's crazy and it's unfortunate but that's 
once again, I think that kind of circles back to why it is so important to have conversations like this. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a big theme too, social connectedness that I keep coming back to, you know, over the last couple of weeks that I've been thinking about this conversation. Um, You know, it's different to talk to a stranger about this because Mm -hmm. you have to lay out all of the things you think are important to or pertinent to the to the incident. Um, Whereas I'm talking to my wife. Well, she already knows my brother. She already knows my family. She already knows me. She already knows. But this is like I'm going to have to think about every detail that I think is going to help a completely uh, an audience full of strangers to try and see at least how I saw this whole thing unfolding. So Absolutely. That, I guess, if you want, I can start kind of. Of course, where yeah, we grew up. childhood. Yeah. Go ahead. So, we grew up in a wealthy suburb. Um, weren't at the upper echelons of that of that wealth, but we were kind of upper middle class in terms of like you know, where the whole country, where the western world sits um in terms of economics, we didn't want for anything. Um, you know, we were raised with you know, I, I think decent decent morals and like, you know, those first 10 years of life are so important, but they're they're also kind of easy. It's like you teach a kid like don't steal, don't lie, don't don't cheat. Um and um but I think for you know, as far as it goes, we we had it really good. I would not have asked for any sort of different childhood. We were not abused, we were not neglect- neglected. Um as far as I know, he wasn't. Um and um you know, we had friends, we were both, you know, socially uh, had had it good. We played sports no complaints. Um, and I'm going to tell you about my adolescence and, and, you know, later my early adulthood, because I think it matters, um, to the story. But basically up until, and a lot of girls go through this, when puberty hits, it's like a whirlwind of depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me it was, there's definitely some depression that runs on the female side of my family. Um, and I, throughout middle school on and off was severely depressed, like not able to get out of bed. Um, and so high school hit, um, I found drugs and alcohol and, um, I think at some points they saved my life. And then at the end, it almost killed me. Um, so throughout basically the end of freshman year through until the time I got sober, I was doing, went from, of course, the natural progression of pot and alcohol to harder drugs, party drugs. And this was in the early 2000s. Um, So it was sort of the, my story was the classic um, opioid crisis uh, story where you found a pill bottle in an adult's medicine cabinet and it's party time, but then the Oxycontin becomes too expensive. And so you end up doing heroin every day. By the time I was 16, I, that's what I was doing every day. And, um, you know, I didn't see a lot of purpose in school. I didn't, I felt like simultaneously like stupid and also completely bored and unchallenged. Um, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for our education system completely failing us. Mm-hmm. But I think smart and also um, contrarian kids like me, like I'm, I can be a real asshole. Um, and I can, I can say no a lot and kids like me do not do well in the traditional school system. Um, and I didn't, and, you know, luckily I did graduate, but it was kind of like the skin of my teeth Mm -hmm. because I was doing drugs every single day. Um, and so I'm going to slow down here because, um, you know, one of the things is I was looking through, through my lens of this incident with my brother was I started thinking back to that those years from 13 until 19 where things obviously got progressively worse. I thought I was getting away with everything. I thought I was like the master, you know, I was doing super adult things and like, um, you know, because I had no meaning in my life, this all of a sudden gave me like a mission. Like I was going to do hard drugs every single day and nobody was going to know about it. Of course people knew about it. And nobody did anything about it. Mm-hmm. It took me getting arrested three times. The first and not some of them had to do with alcohol, but they're all drug and alcohol related. 
The first was I punched my dad in the face because he told me I couldn't drink in the basement. This was the only time that anybody ever tried to impose rules on me. And boy, did they learn their lesson. And they didn't, I don't think they ever really tried again. I, you know, like I said, I punched him in the face. Um, I ended up getting arrested for that. And um, things just continued downhill from there. I ended up getting arrested for possession of cocaine and heroin. Um, I ended up getting arrested for larceny because I was stealing things out of people's cars to get drugs at 18 years old. Um, and I would find out later that, like I said, they did actually have an idea of what was going on. They expressed, and I'm going to try and just keep this as vague as possible because the individuals don't really matter here. Right. The lesson is what matters. Mm -hmm. But they they knew, and and I know they knew because, you know, they family members would tell me I was, I was scared of going into your house or your room and finding you dead. And I just, as an adult now, especially an adult with a kid, it's baffling to me to not take that kid by the shirt yeah. and say, this is done. You're, this is not happening anymore. We're not doing this anymore. Get up. We're going to treatment. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. It took the law. You know, it took getting right. arrested to force me into treatment. And the first time, first time I didn't take at 18, and then the second rehab, it did. So I've been sober now since August 2005. And um, I thank God I was, you know, introduced to a certain spiritual program and um, saved my life. It gave me that discipline of sit down, shut up, take the cotton out of your ears, put it in your mouth, we're going to give you the guide for living, right? A moral guide, mm -hmm. not just do your homework, don't be late. That stuff's important, but we're going to actually give you a spiritual and moral and values-based guide yeah. for living. So that, I think, is what gives me a little bit of a, a different perspective from my family. Um, and I don't think they're bad people. I... <laughs> Quite the contrary. I think they're part of the masses of people who do not who do not have an instruction manual for life. And that doesn't make me any better. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make them worse. It's just it makes me sad. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, I was grateful to be in the program. I, I still am. Um, that's where I go when I'm lost. I go there even before I get lost, right? Because these social connections that we talked about earlier. It's difficult to go to people with difficult stuff when there's no foundation mm -hmm. of, well, I trust you already. And so now that shit's hitting the fan, I'm going to come to you. If you don't have the foundation of like seeing people every week or every day or, you know, on a regular basis mm -hmm. and just checking in, if you don't have that, how can you really expect somebody to come to when when things are going wrong and so I'm just so grateful that that I was brought into into that program and um and so yeah I uh I got sober and basically began living living my life um you know always had their support my family's support like financially that that's the other thing is like financial support's always there. That's how most people, I think, support. The, that's what they consider support. Mm -hmm. um, and and to be fair, too, like I said, it was probably long before we were born and maybe before our parents were born that there was, um, you know, a more structured way of, of teaching your kids how to behave and, and teaching self-restraint and discipline and, like, you know, it could all the way back to when Nietzsche said God is dead. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, and you, you don't necessarily have to be religious to to understand that, but you can understand that when we did throw the sort of moral guide for living out the window, um, you know, everything else fell apart too. Um, because at least we had, even if you didn't believe in God, you had a structure in which to play, mm -hmm. right? You, your parents handed you down, you know, whatever religion you're born into and you can either, you know, throw it out and you can break it or you can adjust it and, and you can play with it. But at least it was something to work with. Yeah. 
And now it's like we don't have anything. It's like make up your morals as you go. Right. And, and you there's know, so yeah. there's so much to it. You know, I feel like there's the one side of things where you want your child to have these morals and follow some sort of not guide, but like you were saying, like understand life and the importance of life and how the best way you can live it. And then there's the other side of things, which is the emotional side of raising a child, which something you mentioned with the financial support, that's great, you know, and that's something that I've always said about my childhood and growing up with my mom. She's always been so great and I, I never needed or wanted anything more than I had but I'm trying to – she listens to the podcast. So I'm like trying to – mom. <laughs> right. But – and she was a great mom. Very loving. Mm-hmm. It's not even to say that she wasn't. That, right. right. It, I just think that there is this lack when it comes to your child and their mental health. People don't really know – I mean it's hard enough to deal with her yeah. own mental health. So it's right. like then you have a child and you have to almost cater to their mental health and there's not – much education on that. Yeah. And I think that that's why it's so easy for things to fall off. Yeah. Because if one thing goes wrong, if there's one trauma, and trauma to everybody is very different, but if trauma happens to someone and that's not addressed, sometimes even if it is addressed, like it, it can just open this door to so many problems, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's just, it has to be known, I think, to parents how important every single aspect is when it comes to raising a child yeah. because if any of those things are neglected i feel like some people get lucky and you know there's children that have the worst childhood mm-hmm. and they turn out to be the best people but then i think that there's other times that people go through so many things and they hold it in and they bottle it up and then they explode yeah and how that explosion happens can come out in a million different ways and then unraveling that and going backwards is years and years of healing and therapy. And then it's like, it just, it's unfortunate. But I feel like that is a very common trend, even just from doing this show. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's like I hear these things that happen and it's like, damn. Yeah. Like, and that's why I say sometimes I don't even know if I want, I never have known if I really wanted children. Mm-hmm. But then hearing how fragile children actually are, like their brains. See, I would push back on that. I would push back because so I'm a therapist mm-hmm. and I do counseling for a living. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding like about about humans and their resilience. Yeah. And so a lot of people, especially young people, will come to me and and think that they're not strong. And I have to kind of coach them and tell them like, right. you actually are very strong. You are very resilient. If nobody's ever told you that, mm. I'm sorry about that. And I'm telling you right now that yeah. you are perfectly capable. And I agree with yeah, that 100%. I, I think too, everybody, every human has right. these abilities that they don't even know. Yep. And everyone is so strong and it has the ability to overcome anything that they can set their mind to. But getting someone to yes, that point, exactly. there are some people that you tell them once or they yeah, hear it once yeah. and they're on it. They're ready to right. go. I feel like oh I'm kind of like that. Right. But then there's other people. It's like you explain it and you explain it. And if they're not ready or they're not there yet, well, it's like talking to a wall. I think there's a big like culture of victimhood that's going on. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about all that, but like – Mm-hmm. This is why I don't see a lot of young people like under 25 in my practice because they're just not – they've grown up with this it's message. Very different. Yeah. yeah, with this message that – Entitlement. Um, well, entitlement and that, you know, if you have been – you know, if you have had some adversity or some maybe even trauma that, that, um, that you have a – you know, even like you said, like a long road ahead of you, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe – but also like nine out of people who experience actual trauma, nine out of 10 people who experience actual trauma, like being blown up in right. Vietnam, actually get better without any counseling mm-hmm. at all. Right. And so there's these like misconceptions about resilience and, and but, but I think the mindset of victimhood is very addictive. Yeah. Because it excuses us, us of all responsibility. Any negative mindset that I feel like is held on to a very strong emotion is going to be addicting and hard to let go of for yep. people. Yep. And yeah, I think it kind of goes back to what I said. If if somebody 
on top of not being ready, but if they also have this mindset of being a victim and almost liking being a victim, they might not Very even comfy. think that they do. It's but right, it, it's it's comfortable. So yeah, just just hold it's me tough. in that blanket of mm-hmm. of I can't. You know, there's nothing I could possibly do. So you know, I'm just gonna sit here in my nice comfy blanket. Right. It's totally understandable. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think yeah. So. I think we got off track. But I know we did. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. Totally. Where I were love you? It. I love it. No, no, okay, no. Good. It's great. Um, because I'm gonna do the same thing. Okay, good. Um, so I think where you where you kind of ended was you did the program. Yes. So yes. you were about how old were you at I was this 19. point? Okay. So I started my life, you know, as a young adult. Went to school, got my bachelor's and master's in social work in my 20s, um, and it became clear that as I was going through my mid to late 20s, you know, my brother's a few years younger than me, it became clear that he was not on the same trajectory of like, yeah, and this is what we were talking about, was I had the program to tell me, um, you're better than this. You you are capable of whatever you want to do. You know, you're smart. You're hardworking. Live up to that. Yeah. And it doesn't seem that my brother got that message. Um, so, you know, we'd hear things like, well, he dropped out of his bachelor's program with a semester left. Um, you know, working sort of dead end, um, jobs, which there's no shame in changing up your career Mm -hmm. and, and exploring, excuse me, new, new pathways and taking menial jobs in the meantime. I have no, no issue with finding yourself and starting over. Um, but this was now a pattern. This was now like, you know, we see, at least I've seen in my practice and in my friends' lives, um, that there's this sort of failure to launch thing for men, especially in their kind of mid-20s through their 30s. And then, you know, all of a sudden they're 40 and living in their parents' basement, um, playing video games all day. And it's just such wasted potential. Mm -hmm. And I saw... um, that was, it seemed to be kind of the pattern that was happening with my brother through our 20s. Um, and I didn't pry because I'm like, hey, this is his life. Right. He's figuring things out. Still young. Yes. And and like I said, I'm not opposed to starting over, going back home. But right. yeah, he, he left college at some point, ended up going back home, working barista jobs and stuff like that. Um, you know, no shame in that. Uh but when it lasts a long time and you don't actually find something that you want to commit yourself to and like suffer for, like I'm going to, I'm going to finish my bachelor's, bachelor's degree. I'm going to finish right. a master's degree. I'm going to stick with a job. Like there was no other plan. Yes. No guidance. Mm-hmm. Again, this sort of lack of discipline, lack of structure, lack of consequences, smoking pot all day. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what the regimen was of that, but at the end it was really bad, like physical withdrawals from marijuana. Um, so, um, you know, we would, I would just kind of sit back and watch and listen to my family say what was going on with him and see him as I would come home to visit. And, um, eventually now I believe this was a year or two before I got married. So like maybe 2013, 2014, uh, his girlfriend got into a program, a master's program, and they moved away um, to go so that she could go to school in this program. And he moved to one of the most expensive places in the country. And, you know, again, there, there are reasons why one would want to live like in New York City or somewhere in California or wherever. Um, maybe you have a, a job there, but there was no, there was just this program. And I just couldn't help but see these sort of little breadcrumbs to like somebody who really needs, <laughs> needs a kick in the ass and wasn't getting it, you know, a loving kick in the ass. Mm-hmm. Like what, what I got from the program that I'm in. Right. Um, and, you know, it's not really my place to do it. I kind of look back and kick myself for not doing it, but we weren't super close at that time. We didn't have much in common. Uh, and I was figuring out myself professionally, becoming completely jaded with the nonprofit world and all of that. And, 
And so, you know, we would come back home and hear these stories about how he needed money again and how, you know, the car payment was, you know, his car was getting repossessed or, or it wasn't getting repossessed because family was paying it off. Or, and then of course, when the pandemic hit and, um, and uh, everybody got their rent paid or got their rent canceled and mm-hmm. they got paychecks for not working. And my, at this time was also a shift for me because I had decided that the nonprofit world was crazy and what we needed was nice landlords, right? People who could help people get off the street and help people who were struggling and give them a second chance. Very naive of me. Um, and if you ever want to become embittered and disgusted with humanity, just become a landlord. I'm telling you this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so that's what I was going through at the time. And so, you know, for example, when, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, like I said, not only did people get paid for not working, but they also didn't have to pay rent. And so to this day, I still have a tenant who owes me like $10,000. Um, and when I went to go apply for the emergency assistance, which I did not get, um, I look at her taxes and I see that she indeed was one of the people who got $10,000 more than the year before for not working and still didn't pay rent. And I'm like, and so I'm having my illusions of helping people shattered. I'm like, this is crazy. People are actually, if they don't have rules and structure and consequences, like they do oftentimes make these bad decisions Mm -hmm. not all the time but like i'd say eight out of the ten tenants i had just 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 were awful Mm -hmm. and um even though they knew that the intent of me bringing them into this housing was to give them a second chance and so i like i said i was going through my own disillusionment with humanity and human nature and and what we do when we have the opportunity to to do the wrong thing and to get away with something and so it was very interesting the the coinciding of the two things because I would find out later that my brother was one of those people who got paid from the government and didn't pay his rent and and so we're sitting here on two different sides of this equation me being a landlord who actually got into it to help people and my brother, who, uh, you know, one of the things that I think kind of highlights the different paths that we took was sitting here, uh, you know, being one of the people who disillusioned me so deeply. And I just want to be clear too, you know, being a freeloader or whatever you want to call, you know, I'm saying that, you know, in jest, Mm -hmm. but like, you know, not paying your bills and having your bills paid by somebody else does not mean you're going to become a sex offender, obviously. Yeah. That's not the point. But, you know, go with me on this journey, if you right. will. And just I, to, yes. to show the difference and just the different paths. and Right. There's yeah. different philosophies and right. how we came to view life differently. And I'm also going to say, you know, the addictions that we had and I am calling it an addiction for reasons I'll explain later but his vice call it and my vice are obviously very different I did not aside from myself being a child I did not hurt children the consequences of these two active addictions are night and day right and I was also a child when I did this he was a grown man it's just getting that out of the way, yeah. right? Just to not be confused about this, obviously. For but, sure. Yeah. But like you said at the beginning, this is not just, if this were somebody who was like successful in every area of his mm-hmm. life, had his shit together, completely, you know, self-disciplined and structured and still did this stuff, I probably wouldn't be sitting here because I wouldn't have all of this kind of right information about like what went wrong. And I think too, because the crazy thing per se is that that can happen too there Mm -hmm. could be people and I think those people are just better at what would the word be for that I don't want to say having like a front but they concealing it yeah yeah, they're just better and almost I think for some people I mean that that goes into a whole nother realm I feel like of it's a different mental stuff but yeah yeah, it's it's crazy to me how because then it 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 may that's what makes research hard exactly is that it can be so different different. it's right exactly and the reason i'm thinking about this stuff at all is because you know to go back a little bit to backtrack like who my brother is 
he's not some kind of psychopath. Mm -hmm. He was never, you know, he loves animals. He loves people. He's a sweet guy. If anything, he might be a little simple. Yeah. Um, But the reason that I bring all of this stuff up about like social structure and cohesion and, you know, supporting each other and encouraging honesty is because I, I cannot, I mean, if anybody would have benefited from that, like he wasn't the asshole contrarian that I was. He wasn't the rebel that I was. If anybody would have benefited from social structure, it would have been him. Right. He's easily influenced. And if he had had some consequences, he was, I sort of compare us like I was a crash and burn airplane. He was like on the slow train to hell. Mm. With every stop along the way, people saying, okay, keep going, keep going. And again, like I said, anybody can get into this mess yep. if you're born, if you're predisposed to this attraction. Absolutely. It's more like the preventative, like what can we do? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Couldn't have said it better. Um, so, so yeah, I s- sort of saw this slow train happening, this slow train crash, I guess, slow train to hell. Um and I would sort of leave because I'm a social worker and I'm and I'm very um, <clears throat> I've learned to restrain my words in such a way that will offer, you know, uh, confidence and hope in people rather than, you know, if I see somebody doing the wrong thing, like if my family says, well, oh, he needed to be bailed down on his rent again. He needed to be bailed down on his car payment again, whatever. I'd be like, oh, you know, when's when do you think you're going to? draw the line here like gently Mm -hmm. super gently because this isn't about again anger or hatred or you know shaming anybody this is about figuring out what we could have done differently and so I would come back home to visit and hear these stories and no when are you guys gonna draw the line here he may need to like step up and and start taking responsibility for his financial situation excuse me um and nothing Nothing would change um, all the way up through the end, even with paying for attorneys and paying for expensive psychological evaluations. Um, but before I get into that, I guess I'll just describe kind of what happened because um, I think it was within the year. I'm a little fuzzy on the timeline. This is very <laughs> – pain does that to you. Yeah. Um, but – I think within the year after the pandemic started, we get this call. Your brother got arrested. The cops beat him up. And remember all the craziness with the cops and everything? Yeah. I was like, oh my God. But I'm like, wow, like that's horrible. He he was the victim of police brutality. You know, he was pulled out of his car for no reason. And, you know, then it was like, okay, well, what was the reason? Well, they said they found stuff on my, you know phone or there were some files on my computer that, you know, this is my brother, that were, you know, child porn and, you know, I would never do that. And, um, you know, I'm being set up. He had had a stalker. So we were like, well, the internet's a crazy place. I've definitely worked with domestic violence victims who have had their phones hacked by their boyfriends and stuff like that. Um, so I'm like, well, crazier things have happened. Sure. Okay. Maybe the stalker guy, you know, hijacked your phone and put some stuff on it or sent you stuff that you didn't actually want. Um, that was plausible to me. And, and so over the course of, you know, of this happening, we, we now referred to my brother as not your brother, your rich brother, because we're going to sue the police department and, and get uh, a lot of money. And looking back, it was, very sad um, because what really happened was they did have actual evidence that no, he did um, actually have a ton of files downloaded to his devices and, um, and he did in fact have conversations with who he thought was a 12 year old, who was actually a detective um, and had brought, you know, <laughs> this really sick stuff. I mean, it's public information if you wanted to find it, but so I'm just going to say it. He had things like soda and candy and weed in his car that had been discussed in this online conversation with this fake 12 year old, um, that he was bringing to offer this, you know, girl. 
and um, they had pictures. And but because we didn't know all of that uh, for the next, let's see, I guess we'll I'll take you through that first year after the arrest. Nobody knew anything. Nobody had any of the evidence except the police department. And I guess they spoke to his public defender or whoever my parents hired. And in that first year, was he still saying that? Was he still denying it? Oh, yeah. Okay. The whole time. Um, this wasn't me. And so, right, he was denying it. Um, and we believed, I believe him. Right. Um, and they did, they, the cops did drag him out of the car. He, I guess, did not move quick enough for them. You know, I guess he had his hands up and didn't move fast enough to exit the car. They pulled him out, tased him a couple of times, which if you are thinking your brother is an innocent person, that seems a little extreme. Yeah. He was not. And so, like I said earlier, nobody likes sex offenders. I'm sure the police were not happy with him for right. these conversations. Doesn't justify it, but you can see now why they did that. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, he denied, denied, denied. I believe, I can't remember at what point the ankle bracelet came on, but he spent most of that, those two years, um, with an ankle bracelet, unable to leave a certain radius. Um, so he had actually started, finally, he had started a small business um, that was somewhat successful. He was transporting um, dogs from shelters to their new homes. Super necessary service, awesome, loved it, um, but he could no longer transport them outside of a certain radius from his house. And so that, you know, was unfortunate, but you know, it was so sad because finally you stumbled into something that was going to be successful. Um, and I kind of, you know, I'm grateful that it, it's something he could still do when he gets out. He does have, you know, the skill set. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to have like, you know, a clean background check to run a small business like that one. Anyway, um, so yeah, he was doing that still assuring everybody that he was innocent, including, and this is important to highlight where on the spectrum of sex offenders my brother sits. He had a long-term girlfriend since, right. I told you, right, yeah, they went out for for her master's program. They, li they moved away. Um, but th what this tells me, him sustaining a long-term relationship with an adult woman this is what tells me that he could have absolutely, like, even if you were born with this predisposition for this attraction to children, you know, if you're able to have a meaningful relationship with another adult, this, this didn't have to happen. You could have built your life around the things that actually were healthy for you. You were not doomed to a life of um, solitude and loneliness mm -hmm. because you were not attracted to adults no he was he was perfectly happy and so that's kind of why i conceptualize this as a sort of addiction right where similar to people like me who you know not everybody deals with addiction this way but um abstinence was the way for me if i do anything i will go you know they say if i if i drink i break out in handcuffs Right. Like I'm I'm I cannot smoke pot. I cannot drink. I cannot do anything because I will go down that same path. You can conceptualize this in the same way where you cannot touch Internet. You cannot touch whatever the things that lead to this damage, this danger. Right. Just don't do it. And let's it's figure the temptation. Out, exactly. Let's figure out a way to prevent it. And um, so, yeah, he was he was doing that job. Um, and had the girlfriend. Had the girlfriend, had the, the business. I don't know where the money was going. I don't know the ins and outs of the financials, but obviously they still had to pay for stuff. Mm -hmm. um, um, my, my family did and uh, had to. They didn't have to. That's, <laughs> that's the thing. You didn't have to get the fancy attorney. You didn't have to get, um, you know, pay the rent. Um, which I later found out that not only they were helping him, but the government was helping. And I'm just like, oh, man, you know, a little responsibility goes a long way. Um, it's not everything, but it certainly wouldn't have hurt. Um, and so 
the state charges. First, they only brought state charges against him. And I, from what I understand, the prosecutor was new on the job. She was inexperienced. I think it was she was inexperienced. And there was some technicality that got it thrown out. And so he could have, at that point, taken probation. He could have taken probation and never served a day in jail. And this is sort of the arrogance that comes with this sense of blissful ignorance is you think you can get away with everything by just saying it didn't happen. And oh, well, state charges were dropped. Oh, well, everybody believes me. I don't have to admit everything and I never have to pay the consequence and I never have to admit it. Um, and so it's almost like this sick, God's sick humor, right? Like, oh yeah, you'll, you'll get the state charges dropped, but just you wait. Because when that happened and he still, um, and he explored suing the police department and he still didn't admit to anything and he didn't accept a plea deal and this prosecutor screwed up in some way um, and the charges were dropped, boy, was the federal government mad. This is my understanding of it, um, that because, I'm pretty sure this is why, because when you transmit things online, it bounces through all sorts of IP addresses in different states, from my understanding, and whatever, whatever <clears throat> pornography, whatever child abuse material is filmed in different places makes it to whatever state you're in, my understanding is it becomes a federal offense. It's no longer just in your particular state. Got it. And so the federal prosecutor was like, oh, well, that's fine. We'll just bring federal charges against you. And um, then it was on. Then it was like, game on. You fucked up. You should have just taken the probation and admitted, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and so we thought we were in the clear. The state charges dropped or over, overturn on technicality or whatever. But the federal charges came and had to hire another attorney. They didn't have to, but that's what you do, I guess, when you have no other, you know, guidance or structure to offer your kid, you give them money. Um, and again, I'm, I can't, just want to be clear. I love my family. Mm -hmm. The reason I am First of all, I've already told you I'm kind of an asshole. I'm kind of, you know, I guess judgmental or whatever. I, I think more just straightforward and blunt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, the thing is, if anybody wanted to have a conversation about this, I'd be more than happy to do it um, because I do love them. And I think part of loving somebody is telling them the truth. Absolutely. And I think we're starved for the truth and we're starved for guidance in our culture today. And, um, and nobody yeah. wants to... To feel or hear that they, not that they were wrong, but that they might have done things to enable. Exactly. Exactly. Because then it falls on them. Right. And that, right. That's the issue with that. So the feds brought the charges and um, I believe my family paid for a federal attorney um, to defend him, but things kept getting kicked out and kicked out as they sometimes do in court, um, continued, continued, and he, I can't remember at what point in the timeline, not only was he made to wear an ankle bracelet, but he had to go to these groups. And we thought it was, because we still believed him at this time. We okay. thought it was preposterous. You have to go to a group with a bunch of sex offenders, like, who are convicted. You know, how dare they make you go to these groups? Well, now we see exactly why. Um, and um, so, yeah, he was doing this and... Um, Nobody knew, actually, and I, I may get the terms for this wrong. I should know because half of my family is lawyers, but I may get the court date names wrong, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure it was during the sub submitting his plea when okay. he finally accepted during these federal charges that the jig was up, that the the game was over, and that he would have to accept some sort of plea bargain, he pled guilty. And I believe it was during that, that even his girlfriend did not know the seriousness of these charges and all of the evidence that they had against him. We were still, 
in the dark. Right. At this point, it was yeah. still his word against the charges, not exactly. really the evidence yet. Because we, we didn't see it. Okay. His lawyer had it, but of course, my brother didn't want us to see the indictment. Okay. Um, and so it was about two days before the plea bargain, I believe it was, the plea, the submission of a guilty plea, that one of my family members sent me a copy of the indictment, which lists out a summary of not only the charges, but a summary of the evidence in specific detail. And that was the point at which everything changed. It became, oh, he's, this happened. This actually happened. And um, kind of what Jung, Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, calls an ego death. When your whole world, everything you were standing on, your foundation crumbles. And you realize that everything you thought you knew is not true. <laughs> um, if that's not true, then what about this? If that's not true, then what about that? And it's like your whole world just kind of falls apart. Yeah. Um, because even if we weren't close, it's still you share half of your DNA mm -hmm. with this person. You, it's your family. You, yeah. Uh, again, my brother was not the kind of, even I wasn't that bad, but he was not like some kind of tornado growing up. Like you said, this could be anybody. It could be the mm -hmm. the the stockbroker. It could be the the homeless guy in the street. Like it could be, anybody could be sort of inflicted with these predilections. Um, but you would hope, you know, any reasonable person would hope they would see red flags. And there were just none. And, and so all of these, the world that you thought existed, all of a sudden does not exist. Um, and uh, there were a few nights of like, crazy like panic attacks and like hyperventilating and like well if this is true then not only is he a monster but he's also at risk of getting beaten up and possibly murdered in prison and maybe suicide thoughts of right. that and it's like all of these things go through your head and you're like this is just fucked mm -hmm. um and so after reading this and world coming down I call my brother a day before the plea deal will be submitted to the court um i said you need to be honest with me now's the time this is it you're we might not see you after you go uh to court on whatever day it was nope didn't do it didn't do it i'm like okay I'm asking you one last time. Right. Um, and even even family like who kind of lived near where they moved, like he was he would see other members of my extended family. Um, they asked him too, did you do this? No. And we're not a family that would, you know, I was listening the other day to the radio. I, I know nobody listens to the radio anymore. I was listening to this this country station and they had the like morning talk show on and and they have these like anonymous phone calls where people call in and they like give their problems mm -hmm. and the DJs will like say their two cents. And um and this guy called in and he had described kind of the opposite of what my family did, which was um the guy co who called in say he was he was me. And he was talking and he was talking about his brother having done something bad and the entire family cut him off and refused to talk to him or forgive him or help or any, mm -hmm. any sort of any sort of support. And he was on the fence like I there's, you know, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. But I'm kind of this, you know, the lone wolf here. Uh you know, trying to be there for my brother. Well, in this case, you know, everybody else seemed to kind of be in denial in my family. And I was the only one saying, well, maybe we should talk about this. And, and, and I just thought it was funny. I heard that the other day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, my, I was, I was pressing him.
before that day before court and um nope nope didn't do it wasn't me i don't know what happened the stuff just ended up on my phone and um said the same thing to my cousin who had asked him and um and then the day came and all the entire indictment was read out in court and his girlfriend also did not know of these specific charges and all of the evidence until it was read out by the judge in the courtroom. She completely lost it. Um, you know, what I had gone through the 48 hours prior when I received the indictment, she was now going through in the courtroom. Horrible, horrible. I mean, somebody you're with for right. 15 years, right? Since college. So I think at that point, um, you know, everybody kind of goes into, and my family goes into action mode and his girlfriend's family trying to get her back home and clean up the apartment, figure out what to do with all their animals. A lot of animals because um, they were doing this transport business. And so they ended up sort of keeping the ones that were either not adopted yet or some sort of, you know, error in the adoption or whatever. Um but yeah, they had to figure out all of that. And um, I just kind of, uh, that was not this past Thanksgiving, but the one before that. It was just before that. And I remember because three things happened all at once. I told a deer jumped in front of my car, total my car. That happened. And um, my dad had some sort of health scare. Um, that's how I remember that. That, that part of the timeline is accurate. Um, but I remember I came, I came home to try and support my family and just be there for them and like be the strong person. Um, cause if I was falling apart, like they must've been yeah. even worse. And so I tried to be, to do the right thing and, and to, you know, just show up. Cause a lot of, a lot of support is just like being present mm -hmm. and physically there in case somebody needs something. Um, you know, like I skipped out on my wife's, I think both holidays that year because it was, um, it was so crazy and I just wanted to be with my family. Um, but nothing was really talked about. Um, I think everybody was kind of still in denial. Mm -hmm. Um, except me, of course, I, I did my crying and my hyperventilating and talking to, my support system and you know it's not a ton of people but i i do have my people that keep me going yeah um and um and so as time went on now now that the guilty plea was in um everything was about sentencing and how to again you know not have a lengthy sentence Nobody ever talking about, you know, well, why did you lie to us for so long? Talking about how we got here. And that was, you know, it was like a deafening silence, right? Like for somebody like me to not bluntly talk about this stuff is it's very painful because I'm like, the way you get through things is you talk about them until there's nothing else to talk about and then you move on and take right. responsibility. It's not how my family works. Um, and so there was a, an expensive attorney hired, um, and like I said, the psychological tests, <clears throat> and this is when, you know, like you said at the beginning, you kind of have two broad paths in this. The family can come together and face what's happening and be strong for each other, or you can kind of be in denial and not talk about it and pretend to it, it's going right, to go it's away. there, but you, it's just not being spoken about. Exactly. And, and so me, and it was about, I want to say a year ago that, um, you know, one of my family members calls me, it's pretty late at night, not super late. It was like nine, a little after nine, these psychological tests are happening. And, you know, I'm in the field, mental health field, 
and human services. And so this family member called me. It's a couple, two of them were on the line. And they're like, do you think your brother's autistic? I'm like, no, no, he's not. No, not everybody who's a little awkward is autistic. Sorry, hate to break it to you, culture. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's, this is the, the diagnosis du jour, like bipolar was back in the 80s and 90s and even, you know, after that. Um, no, he is not autistic. He is, he gets along socially with everybody. Um, no, he's not. Uh, you know, and I was kind of having this like lighthearted conversation didn't see where this was going at all. Quick question. Sure. Did you guys as a family decide to run those tests or were these tests done by? These were recommended by whatever specialist he was seeing. Okay. So like they hired the lawyer. The lawyer recommended this person to do this testing. Okay. I, fine. Right. But if you're going to ask me, I'm blunt. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. No, I don't think he's autistic. I okay. think I think at this point... You know, at this point, he, when I had, I had talked to him pretty much weekly on the phone, not about anything in particular. Oh, how's the food? Do they let you go outside? Um, are you able to work out? You, you know, how's your roommate? You know, all of this just surface level stuff. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, like I said, I had done my part to take care of my health, my mental health and all that. Um, but I was kind of getting annoyed because now it had been from thank before Thanksgiving to the spring and he was awaiting sentencing in the local jail. And at this point, you know, even though I had been taking care of myself and um, pretty mentally okay, I was kind of getting annoyed that this was this whole charade was still going on that nobody was going to actually talk about what happened. Right. He wasn't going to apologize. Exactly. It's almost like for yourself, you almost wanted the closure of like, listen, tell me you did it. Let's have whatever conversation we need to have. And then when it comes to your family, like, can we all just address that this Elephant. is what's happening? Right. right. Elephant in the room. Exactly. Because then it's like this, the door is still open yep. to yep. it. Right. Exactly. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a super mushy person. Right. I don't need to go on and on crying and all of this stuff. You know, I'm very like straightforward. Right. Let's just get it out of the way. Let's just admit it. Exactly. Right. And and so. And understand. Of, right. And part of my program too, when I be, came into recovery was you take responsibility. Mm -hmm. You make amends. Right. And you say you're sorry. And I should not have done that. Mm -hmm. Right. Part of. I, th I see a lot of people in my practice and they want to know, um, they don't know they want to know, but once they realize, say like, say I'm doing like a couples thing and, um, you know, one of them has realized, has finally accepted that they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a lot of us have never been taught how to make amends with another person, how to apologize properly. And the way I was taught is like, you say what you think you did to hurt the person, listen, I did A, B, and C, that clearly hurt you. You can tell me if I did something else to hurt you, um, but I want to apologize for that and tell you that I should not have done that. And if I could go back, I would have done things differently. What can I do to make it right, right? Pretty simple, but not things that were taught. Yeah. Um, you know, and... Where is I going with that? Yeah, so that's where I was coming from. And I kind of, when you, when you get sober young in this sort of program, you kind of forget that the world doesn't, just because you grew up doesn't mean the world grew yep. up. And that most adults walking around are actually super immature. And and you forget that because you don't know any better. You're, I was a 19-year-old. Not like, everybody's on the same path and in the same place. There's no, you know, all these other people don't have a guide to yeah. say, this is how you might want to consider living. You know, mm -hmm. like if you screw up, this is how you might want to consider making amends for it. And so I try to keep that in mind. So I'm having this conversation back to the phone call and, um, 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 you know, I'm on the phone with these two family members and, um, and they're talking about, is he autistic? I'm saying, no, oh, he's not autistic. That's that's a that's funny that they they're even thinking about that because we know him and 
He's not socially awkward. And it's kind of a lighthearted conversation at this point. My guard is down. Um, and, and, um, and I say, you know, because it is kind of annoying me at this point, I say, you know, has he on any of your phone calls with him shown any kind of remorse or like taken responsibility or any accountability? Have you guys even talked about what happened with him? Like, honestly, and the reaction I got was so full of rage. And so it was like I had accidentally stumbled into a very sore nerve, you know, an open wound. And the rage that I got back was basically saying, you shouldn't be asking these questions because you were a drug addict. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes. And like I said, I have nothing but love for my family. But when I say my, the way I was made to mature by my mm. program is not the way most of the world was made to mature, this is a great example. I think it's sad too because, and this is just speaking outside of someone being your friend, your family, anything, some people resort to a jab when they feel like they need to be defensive and they're angry and they're sad because of the situation and all that they, I think, knew how to do was just you got it. pull a knife out. You got it. Right. And me, I felt like I was stumbling into it because I was not, I thought we were having sort of a casual conversation right. and I could sort of just slip it in there and, and just feel right. out what their conversations had been like. And boy, I had no idea. And so because I, I was blindsided by mm -hmm. it, I went into it rage right right blind rage i don't even remember what i said i said something like this is a grown man mm -hmm. child predator i was a i was a child and i took responsibility for my life and i have no idea what was said really yeah just hung up um and that was something i wasn't sure i was gonna be able to salvage the relationship after that because when you're dragging down one sibling to hold up another I just don't see how that's a sustainable yeah. relationship. Um, but we had just had a baby, right? That throws another mm -hmm. uh, curveball into the situation where my wife, you know, we had him in um, March. So that spring and then a couple months later is when that conversation happened. I'm almost positive. Like I said, my timeline's a little fuzzy. Yeah. But yeah, at the time I was like, I can't believe, you know, You'd be saying this, risking your relationship with your, you know, right. my baby. And and <laughs> I'm not the one to advocate cutting people out. I know that's a big thing these days. I would rather go to any length to save a relationship mm -hmm. with family because you only have one biological family. Well, also, too, I, I think that you're not coming at it in a way to even – talk bad about him it's more so to once again understand and to address the situation and to gain more insight not you know what I mean I, I just and just to say I, I don't think I don't think there's any shame in taking responsibility no it's it's actually a point of pride so I guess and obviously if there's anything I ever asked and you don't want to answer yeah. let me know um so I guess at this point your family Maybe deep down they knew it was true based on the evidence, but overall you think that for the most part they still kind of wanted to be in denial about it? I don't want to speak to that because I don't know what was going on okay. in their heads, but my impression from these conversations was, well, minim minimizing it. Okay. Um, easier, maybe easier to just not to get into it. Well, <laughs> The, the answer, I think, after, I think it was on that phone call even, that one of them said, I never should have sent you the indictment. That was the response to this. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I'm angry at him too for yeah. not taking responsibility. It was, I should have covered this up more. And so huh. my, you know, this is like, my brain just like short circuits. Right. Like my whole fucking soul just short circuits. And I'm just like, what the fuck does that even mean? Yeah. So your answer to this, your solution to this wouldn't be to go back and have all of us take responsibility for whatever our part in this was. 
But your response to this is to hide the truth, to cover it up. And so to answer your question, I think there was, of course, you can't ignore what's written on that page, what the police found. Um, and you can't ignore the ages of those people that were on his phone. Um, I, I just don't, I don't understand how you can live in a world and be so, and live in that level of denial, mm -hmm. right? Again, it's not out of a place of hatred. It's not, right. it's not out of a place of anger. It's out of a place of deep, deep disappointment and sadness. Yeah. Um, because this stuff, you don't, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm a very forgiving person. I've worked with sex offenders before. I wrote this in the letter to the judge, you know, um, uh, I've worked with some pretty people who've done very bad things, right. In my professional life. So, uh, for me, anybody who knows me would know that, yeah, I'm blunt, I'm straightforward, but like, it's for a higher purpose. It's to like get to the truth so we can get better. Um, and, and so, yeah, there was, there was a bunch of denial. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that time, like I said, the baby was there. I didn't want this fracture in our family to cause an ending of a relationship between my newborn baby and my family. Um, I still wanted, even if these two people weren't able to have a healthy relationship, um, I still wanted to be able to share him with my family. Yeah. Um, and I was already a mess, you know, in knots about the fact that, like, I did not want my brother to see my baby because... And that's a whole other just sadness for you, I'm sure. Oh, my sure. God. It's like a – I mean, I don't want to say a death, but it's like a death. It's horrible. It's a, it's a complete breaking of, of any bond between yep. them. And, um, you know, and, and he's – you know, these same family members were in such denial that they didn't understand why I didn't want to send, like, pictures of the baby to my brother in prison and jail. I'm like – isn't that kind of like giving, sending heroin to a heroin addict in jail? I'm not trying to be an asshole, but like, let's be real. Right. And and also, yeah. it comes down to your comfort, your wife's comfort, yeah. Yeah. and ultimately the safety of your child. Exactly. It's like at that point, and that's right. something that I think a lot of people have a problem with is the separation. Yeah. You know, it's like at that point, it doesn't matter who's family, who's not. It just, thank you. You're just. Doing in, in your heart what's right. Yeah. Safety. Right. Exactly. So you're taking the extra precautions and measures. And yes. why not? Can't I mean, hurt. I don't, even see, I don't even see that as extra. I see that as like, listen, we're just going to make sure we're not putting my brother in an awkward right. position. But you're not, yeah. Putting my son in an awkward position. My wife. Like, right. I want everything to be good too. But for us to close our eyes and pretend yeah. that it's good is not going to make it good. And so I'd rather just, like you said, be safe mm -hmm. and and not and not make it weird. Like, yeah. we'll figure it out as we go. But exactly. But, like, don't make me feel weird for not wanting to yep. involve my baby. And this is all within the last year. So this was all, yep. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. And then what was his sentence? So this is interesting as well. We want to think about the whole timeline of everything, mm -hmm. he could have had probation if okay. he had just taken those state charges. And then the reason why he didn't is because he went on to try to sue the police and then it kind of... It wasn't... I think it was a mixture of that and him just saying, this wasn't me. Okay. Nope. Got it. Wasn't me. I'm okay. not going to admit to this. But yeah, no, it was just the failure to admit. Failure to admit. They just wanted him to plead guilty, take, take the probation, and go. Now, do you think that if he would have <laughs> taken the probation... That all of you guys would have believed that it didn't actually happen. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I mean, that's I don't see right. Why. Isn't that so interesting to think about? Because would we have even seen the indictment? Right. Um, maybe he still would have been out there right, with you his don't girlfriend. Know. I mean, but this almost makes me think: like, did this have to happen for well, one for him to be stopped? Mm -hmm. Right. Who knows what access he would have had to internet, to whatever. Yeah. Maybe none, but who knows? 
Um, but, but for the bullshit to be stopped, mm -hmm. for the lying to be stopped. This is, in my mind, this had to happen. Because like you said, we still may have been on this narrative of um, didn't do it. Right. Someone put it here. I, I had to take the plea to, to not go to prison. But yeah, we still might have been there. Um, it's crazy what happens when you deny the truth, you know? Yeah. Um, then we, yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that happened, I believe, within the last year. Yeah. Yeah, because he's only 14 months. Mm -hmm. um, so, I asked the sentence. Oh, the sentence. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so, right, we're think about how he could have had no jail time. And now we were looking at, and I may be fuzzy on this, but I generally know because, so I'll tell you why I know this. Um, a reporter picked up on the case um, specifically because of my letter of support for my brother and how it was different from my family's. And um, I got in contact with her. She did very respectful, objective reporting on it. And I said, you know, because she had written in this article mm -hmm. that he could have gotten a lot more. The sentence was extremely high for, uh, or the proposed sentence was extremely high um, based on these specific charges in comparison to other people who have had these charges. But my theory is that the prosecutors were so mad that the state's charges got dropped on a technicality and that he was so stubborn mm -hmm. and not admitting that he did this that I think they went for, I think it was like 30 years. Wow. Right. And so eventually as negotiations went on, um, my brother and his lawyers basically said, you know, are you willing to have us accept these particular charges, drop these two, I'll plead guilty to these. I don't remember the exact wording of the charges. Mm -hmm. I think they were still basically what I told you before, possession of the child abuse material and attempting to meet up with a 12-year-old for sex in legal terms. Um, and they accepted that, but we still didn't know until the day of sentencing what the judge was going to agree to because ultimately it's up to the judge, is my understanding of it. Um, and so he could have gotten 30 years, um, and I think the minimum was somewhere around 10. And so he ended up getting about 12. And the reason I'm sort of scoffing is because the people, the family members who went to the sentencing to support him um, came away from the court date um, with the impression that he got the max. And as I just told you, no, the max was a lot more. The max was like 30 years, if I remember correctly from talking to that reporter. Um, and so, no, he did not get the max. He was not, he was no longer a victim. Okay. He, the, the prosecutor and the judge, because I ordered the transcripts myself, I wanted to see exactly what was said in that courtroom. And both, from what I remember, because I read it a while back, I don't want to look at this stuff again, but um, over the, the winter, I, I read that the prosecutors and the judge agreed that he did have a supportive family network and that they were okay with not doing the max. And so again, you have this misalignment or misunderstanding or willful misunderstanding. I'm not sure if it's willful or not. Um, we can convince ourselves of, you know, like I said, the victimhood mentality, oh, he got the max. He did not get the max, right? We can convince ourselves still as he's being taken away in handcuffs that he is somehow a victim of like the system or something. And, um, you know, I was under the impression until I talked to that reporter that he got some maximum sentence. Well, it was a high sentence because prosecutors were pissed, but it was not the max that they had initially um, suggested to, mm -hmm. to the court. And so, yeah, about 12 years and he had already been in County jail for, I think, was it Thanksgiving, a year and change. Okay. Something like that. 
year and a half. And is that counted towards the 12? Yep. Okay. And so now I think he's scheduled to come out 2035-ish, something like that. Um, But yeah, uh, then, (laughs) and the reason I was bringing up I didn't want there to be a fracture in my family because of the baby, you know, not a lot of us are having babies these days, and and I think it's important to salvage whatever family you have. Um, but I, I tried my best to have you know to bring the baby to you know family gathering. Apparently, um, you know after I had had this falling out with these two family members, um, one of them had told the rest. Uh, or at least multiple other family members that I had like disowned my brother and that I had not forgiven him. That was what they took away from this conversation. Even though I had spoken to him every week on the phone, I had written him a letter of support. I had even spoken to the psychiatrist or the psychologist when she was doing the psyche vow. Um, And so again, another example of like, what kind of delusion do you have Mm -hmm. to live in to to make these stories up about the one person in the family who wants to tell the truth. That's, uh, that's how dangerous I am to <laughs> these delusions, I guess. Um, and I was, it was just so disappointed because yeah. I was trying to salvage the family and I go and I bring the baby down for this gathering and that's what I hear from my other family members that I have not forgiven my brother. And first of all, Forgiven what exactly? Because I haven't gotten an amends. Um, I don't. And that's what I was going to ask you. So up until this point, he still hasn't. I don't. I think he. Um, I don't know if he had basically said yes. I did this when I pressed him on it at that point. But okay. I'm basically sure. I guess. But like I yeah. said, nobody. When nobody has told you how to make amends mm-hmm. and to say and to be mature, right? And take responsibility. I, if I were in his position, I'm not sure I would know how to formulate the words yeah. either. Um, but I certainly don't hate him for that. Right. Uh, um, but I'm also not going to beat around the bush here. Like, you need to figure this out. You need to figure out how to how to save your life. Right. And then with your family, have you guys had any type of conversation? So to the person who who made those comments about, like, comparing comparing us and right. – Um, I had written them a letter, um, saying, you know, you've been so hurtful. You can't talk to me like that. Um, this is why what you said is wrong. And I have to seriously think about our relationship going forward. Um, so that over the last year has slowly, that person basically, again, doesn't know how to Mm -hmm. take responsibility. And so, you know, I've done my best to, to forgive and to, try and just move forward but it's it's an arm's length yeah. relationship so it it is what it is i mean i don't hate them i <laughs> i wish they would do better but um what can you do they're not mm-hmm. if, if you're not you know the whole student is ready the teacher will appear literally the student has to be ready the teacher can be there the whole time right the right thing the lesson can be there right in front of your face but unless the student is ready you don't see it. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like obviously there's multiple different factors that kind of pour into why I think you went out on your own and did research. Like yeah. obviously your career path yeah. plays a role. But also I think because within this actual experience, when it came to your family and your brother, there was never this concrete conversation or honesty or openness that I almost feel like it pushed you into having to do this research so that you can almost get an understanding and a sense of some sort of closure on the situation since you can't really get it from the direct source. Absolutely right. Absolutely. I mean, like you said, first of all, that's my natural curiosity. And I, when tragedy strikes, shower me in facts, Mm -hmm. please. I need to understand even the possible explanations for why this happened. Um, but absolutely, if if he had said to me, you know, this is how life went, this right. is what happened, th- 
this is how I ended up This is what led me to this point, right. There's nothing. I actually came to him on one of these phone calls with this research. And I said, you know, which, you know, where do you fall into all this? Because I want to know for my peace of mind. And, you know, one of the interesting things, too, about the German study was a lot of men reported, and this is why I bring up the porn addiction stuff, a lot of men reported starting out with a just basic porn addiction, mm. you know, multiple times a day, unable to stop, but almost treating it like an extreme sport Yeah, where uh, that's not enough. And what about this? Um, we do that for a couple months yeah. and that's not enough either. How much can you take? And that was kind of what he, he copped to being the category that he was in. I don't know, though, because when somebody lies to you for two years, right. nothing they say can be trusted. And then there's, I then it leads into the possibility that he might not even exactly. know. Exactly. Exactly. It could have been, yeah, maybe maybe the long-term girlfriend was a front. I, I don't know. Right. I have no idea. And so when I say all of this about responsibility and social cohesion and, you know, family structure and morals and all of that, I don't know. It may still have happened. Right. I have no idea, but what else can I do? Like, it certainly wouldn't have hurt. It's more so, I think, too, and this is, we've been saying this in just different ways, but it's more so to understand the importance of conversation and honesty and openness and all these different foundations as you're a child and growing up and just throughout your life and why they're so important. Because obviously there's only so much we can control and prevent. But if we have a better understanding and we know that we're taking the responsibility for ourselves and those around us and vice versa, that we're doing the right thing and like all that we can do. You said, I mean, I couldn't say it any better. That's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Like Mm -hmm. that's exactly where I'm coming from. Right. Because right when I was 19 years old and given these tools for how to live and how to be honest and how to take responsibility and how to be there for people and, and engage in actual genuine relationships, I'm not sure I ever had that. Even as great as my childhood was, like I said, it's, it's easy to raise a kid from (laughs) zero to 10, you know, teach them don't lie, don't steal, blah, blah, blah. But then once you get into the real world and that child is no longer a child, like where's the guidance? Yeah. Where's the, t- where, how do you, how are you coaching them when it comes to the tough decisions? Right. Where there are real trade-offs. This is a real trade-off. You admit that you're a sex offender and you have this stamped on you for the rest of your life, but you have probation. Like that's a fucking trade-off. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know how to handle those tough decisions, with your values in ha- ha- firmly in hand, what, what kind of life do you have? Yeah. It's way end up here. So, um, yeah, like I said, the, then my, my family thought I was like abandoning my brother. Um, and I would never do that. Even if, even if it was just sort of a surface level relationship, that's like an arm arm's length. I wouldn't just be like, well, fuck off. I never want to talk to you again. Like, that's just not who I am. Right. Um, uh, same goes to the rest of my family. Um, but it was really heartbreaking to hear that this person had told them that I had done that. And I don't know what, again, what kind of delusion you have to live in to, to get that from these conversations. Yeah. But it goes, again, it just reinforces this idea that, like, I'm not living in the same world as these people. Um and um yeah i'm just thinking i'm just thinking back through my career too and like you know picking up homeless sex offenders out of the gutter and taking them to detox like the lengths i've gone through to help people mm-hmm. and to think that my own family wouldn't believe that um <laughs> that i would be compassionate and that i would be forgiving and that i would i'm waiting i'll wait right. until my last breath I'll wait beyond that. I'm here, you know. And that's the thing too is people have to understand that everyone's going to handle and approach things very differently. And I think that most of the time as a human, we want answers. And it's frustrating when we don't get them. And other people, they might be fine with not getting an answer because it is easier and they don't have to deal with the emotion that comes with that. 
And I think that when you start stepping on on that, people don't know how to handle it. And that's not to say anything mean. It's just to state the truth. And that's just how it is. And it's unfortunate. But everyone is different. Yep. You got it. You got it. Yep. Exactly. And I and I come here today to a wide audience to say, like, if there is a message, if there is a lesson in this, and just to be clear, like, like I said, I have forgiven all of these people. Yeah. I have no, and it's not like condescending forgiveness. It's like actual love. Like, I don't want to lose you. Right. Um, but I, I come here with the lesson that if there was ever more social cohesion and connection in our culture, like it's not here now Mm -hmm. and we need it desperately. And it's on the foundation that you described, honesty, responsibility, actual genuine conversations where we're getting to the bottom of things and figuring out how best do I live, right? Yeah. And I think the thing too to realize is even with these conversations and research and understandings, we might not ever get concrete answers, but at least we're trying and at least we're talking. Yep. Because the more that we don't speak and we keep our mouth shut, I think the further it drives a wedge and the more distance there is in humanity and people and relationships. And that's key yep. to solving problems and keeping people together and preventing bad things from happening. And we can only prevent so much, but at least – If we know that we're trying, it's a step in the right direction. Exactly. Exactly. It's not going to hurt. Right. 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 It can't hurt. Exactly. Yeah. As long as the – What can hurt is staying quiet. Staying quiet and then like we talked about earlier, you know, becoming so divisive and so dug in Mm -hmm. in our opinions that we can't have conversations because they're too violent. Like they're too angry. Mm -hmm. It's like that's not good either. We need to have like actual human connection where we're hearing each other. Yeah. I'm open, you know, I'm, I do it for a living. Right. Uh, so, you know, if that's, if that's, if there's any lesson from this, that's what I take from it, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's a very yeah. important conversation to have for so many different reasons, like we were saying in the beginning too, whether it's somebody that might know somebody or be related to someone that has done something. It doesn't yep. even have to be the exact same thing. Nope, it could be anything all. where – you don't agree or it it affects you because like we just said what the decisions people make around us they usually do have an effect and people don't always know how to cope with it and deal with it and it can be very easy to to shut your own beliefs down because you're trying to make others happy And I feel like even in your situation, that could have been an easy thing for you to do because you're like, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you should just conform to what everybody else – what's easier for everybody else, you know? You just hit on something too, like the power of our convictions. Like Mm -hmm. I feel like we have convictions now and like these strong beliefs, a lot of them are like political and it's like, you know – they're not rooted in the same sort of convictions I think that we used to have, yeah. which is honesty, truth, responsibility, you know, these sort of Western values that like maybe we shouldn't throw them in the garbage so yeah. fast, right, for pe- for pleasing people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm taking a risk. Like if somebody recognizes me on here, like could be over. Like I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but that's right. why I say like I come here with the best of intentions. Mm-hmm. Not to throw dirt on anyone's name. Like, exactly. This is a big risk because I'm a very private person. Like, I don't even have any, like, personal social media accounts or anything. I have, like, some – I've actually started a couple that I'll that I'll give you that are, you know, kind of more anonymous. But, okay. like, but, like, I don't – like I said, even my second-tier friends don't know about this. Mm-hmm. And so I'm – you know, I've got to say, like, this is a risk. Right. Somebody recognizes me. It's like could be. There's game like over. two sides of it. It's mm-hmm. like the one side of it is this is your personal life. Right. This is your family. This is your story. And then on the other side, I bring it back to again. In a way, this is your career to yeah. help people yeah. and to educate. And I feel like it serves both of those things so well because it shows people that 
it's it's relatable. You get it. You understand. But then it also gives people an insight on the understanding and the knowledge behind it and what can really happen and how it trickles down the family tree almost and affects the people that are around. Yeah. And not even the educational career side, yeah. but like my actual values. Mm-hmm. Like, do I stay quiet? Are right. my values, you know, I was talking about this with my wife last night. Like, is this the right thing to do? Well, my values are truth, honesty, same thing, mm-hmm. responsibility. And so if if that's maybe if one person hears this story and says, well, maybe I should reach out to my family member or my friend that's right. struggling or or just to say hi. So like I said, you build the foundation before yeah. shit hits the fan. Exactly. If one person does that, my job will will have been done. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think this was amazing. Yeah. You did such a great job. Seriously. Nice. Like I I think it was great. You couldn't have done anything better. And I appreciate you wanting to come on here and share this story. It means so much to me. I think it's such a great episode. It's so important. And I appreciate it so much. So thank you. Thanks for having me.